Well, this series, the uh, 2020 vision, been looking at faith, hope, and love, which is the way that, that God measures churches and the way that we should measure a church. And we've we had a look at um, Paul's writing at the beginning of Ephesians and Colossians and Thessalonians. He said, this is, this is how you're going on faith, hope and love and complimenting them and encouraging them. We came across another passage that was in Hebrews and also we haven't looked at it but there's another one in Peter and they're general letters so you don't get the compliments to the, the local congregations in them. But there's one other, and it's probably the most famous, the most well-known of the passages, and that's in Corinthians, and 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. And it says, Now remains faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And that's famous because um, most weddings that we go to, it gets read out. Because all that chapter 13 is about love. And it's very appropriate for, for people starting out married life. But originally, it was written to a congregation. But why is it near the end of the book? Why didn't he put it at the front of the book? Well, when you, get into 1 when, when you get into 1 Corinthians and you read it through, you suddenly realise that he didn't give them any compliments at the beginning because he couldn't think of anything nice to say about them. At the beginning of 1 Corinthians, he, he thanks God for the graciousness of the gifts he has given them. But there's nothing about faith or hope or love because the Corinthians, well, they may not have got a score of zero out of 100, but it was mighty close. This, this was the church that had the most going for it in many ways, but it was the least mature church in the New Testament. And we get to the end of um, 1 Corinthians and Paul signs his name because it's been, um, he's been dictating it to a secretary. But I think he had to do that for this letter because most of the time he would have been speaking like this and pulling his hair out because they were just they were just such an embarrassment. Let's have a look at 1 Corinthians 13 and think about it as addressed to a church um, rather than individuals. The first three verses, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. <clears throat> Paul's there saying, look, <laughs> all through this he's saying, this is love and this is you and they're not, you're not matching up. They had a lot of gifts. And in the early church, when the, when the Bible had not been completed, um, people would have the gift of prophecy so that they could say what God wanted to say to them because the Bible wasn't complete. And others would have the gift of miracles or speaking languages that they hadn't learned. They were spectacular things and they were to draw in outsiders and to verify the message of the gospel. And they had it more than any other church. They had gifted people. They had spectacular signs. 
but they weren't mature. They were worthless to God and they were worthless to each other because they were concentrating They were concentrating on the gifts and they were concentrating on themselves. They thought that those things were to make them famous, to make them uh, the stars. And that's not what their gifts were for. Can we have the next couple of verses? Love is patient and kind. Love is not (coughs) jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. Looking through Corinthians, they were in, they were forming into factions. Um, You know, they say, oh, I'm a follower of Paul. I'm a follower of um, Apollos. I'm a follower of Christ. They're interested in praise for themselves. They, they, they were fighting. They had no time for anybody else. They were involved in court cases. They'd sort of rip each other off in the business, in the, you know, their daily lives. And then they'd go to court. And Paul says, can't you sort it out yourself? Isn't it better to be wronged than to... You know, go to court over these things? They are intolerant of... (sighs) They had no time for each other. They are only looking after themselves. They used to have the potluck dinners where they... Yeah, they'd all get together for a meal and they'd have the Lord's Supper at the same time. Except some people would come and they'd eat all the food and drink all the wine and other people would miss out. Because they were thinking about themselves and they weren't thinking about others. And Paul would say, this isn't how it's supposed to be. You haven't got any love. It does not rejoice about injustice but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. There are some people in the, in the congregation who weren't strong in their faith and they had trouble and they had, they had a problem with um, the idolatry that was around them. And those people who were strong they said, oh, look, I don't care about them. I'll just keep on doing what suits me. It'd be like if you knew someone had a p- trouble with drink and you insisted on taking him to the pub because you wanted to have a beer instead of taking them to the coffee shop. They had no tolerance. They didn't care if someone else was, um, had a problem. They said, no, nah, this suits me. Don't care about you. They had behaviour that would that caused disgrace in the general community. They had one fellow there who was having an affair with his mother-in-law. And they said, this doesn't even happen outside the church. What do you think you're doing? And you're boasting about it. No. They had no love. They were only interested in themselves. Verses 8 and onwards. Prophecy in speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy only reveals part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, 
like puzzling reflections in a mirror, and you know, um, not a mirror like we have, more like you know, you get a reflection in a glass window as you go by, but it doesn't look, you can't get a good look at it. They didn't have proper mirrors then. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we'll see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I'll know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Three things will last forever, faith, hope and love, and the greatest of these is love. The Corinthians had missed the boat. There was still hope. I mean, Paul's not writing them off entirely, but he's writing to them to encourage them and to encourage them to change, to get to know God better, to let him change their lives so that that change will come out in love. Now... um, We've got the pink on either side as love. And when I drew that, first of all, I thought, right, well, that's love. You're reaching out and the church is reaching out. But actually, most of the New Testament, when it talks about love for for Christians, is talking about love inside the church. So, So there. That's the main thing. The first thing that we've got to address is our love for each other. I'm not saying that we don't have the other, but just at the moment we're going to talk about love for each other inside the church. Philippians 2, verses 1 to 8. It's not on the board, but I'll read that out to you. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born a human being. He humbled him. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. We must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Looking at the Corinthians, what they were doing wrong, I'm thinking the basic problem is they were selfish. But you could probably go a bit further than that. The basic problem was that they didn't have that connection with Christ. They didn't have the same attitude. Because Christ had love. All of his life was love. And it was done for our benefit, not for his benefit. To come to um, 1 John chapter 4. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, 
we've seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. All that confess that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it's for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people who we can see, how can we love God whom we can't see? And he has given us this command, those who love God must also love their Christian brothers and sisters. And as we were reading that, I was thinking how it connects, how love connects with the faith and the hope. Because it's our relationship with God, it's our experience of being forgiven, and our experience of getting to know Him that's the source of our love. And it's hope working out in our lives to change us to be more like Christ, to be more loving, that allows us to become loving people, people like Christ. And so they're all connected. I was thinking, I was thinking of a, an image of a, um, of a plant and that faith is the root and hope is the stem and love is the flower. I don't know how that will stand up. <laughs> Sometimes these, these pictures don't hold up really well, but perhaps it, perhaps it will help you. See also what John says? How can you say you love God if you don't love your Christian brothers and sisters? If love is not being lived out in the congregation, you've got to wonder whether that connection is with God is as strong as you think. Now, I think we score a lot higher than the Corinthians. I think most churches do. But however well we, we do, we can always grow more. We can always grow more in love as we grow in knowledge and understanding of his love for us. We can grow uh, as we let God make us more Christ-like. And we can grow as we learn how better to express his love to those in the congregation around us. Um, John was saying that uh, he's given us this command, those who love God must also love their Christian brothers and sisters. That um, is also a quote from Jesus himself in uh, John's Gospel. John chapter 13. Jesus said this, Now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So I've got a command. It's not an optional extra. And he wouldn't give us a command unless we could, he was sure that we could do it and that he would fit us to do it. But it's also important that um, as we love inside the church, it has an effect outside the church. It will prove to the world that you are my disciples.
the Corinthians thought being having a lot of gifted people, that would prove to the outside world. He said, no. And he went on in chapter 14 to say, well, look, they're important. And yes, they draw people in. But they're not the main thing. It's love that draws people in. And as people see us united with Christ, joining together, the Corinthians, they, you know, they write off a lot of people and say, oh, look, you, they're not important to the church. It's only the, the stars that are important. And Paul said, no, no, it, it, the church is a body. Jesus is the head, but everyone's important. You need to have eyes and ears and elbows and knees. And some you think about a lot and others you don't, but you need them all. And we're all important in this congregation. And we have to love each other. And in doing so, people outside will see that we are followers of Christ, that we are being remade into his loving image. Can we have the other love added to it, please? I think we can do both at the same time. Well, you could do the faith, hope and love and the little ones as well. Because once we're joined together, we can reach out a lot more effectively. And if we want to reach people for Christ, if we want to evangelise, we have to start here. Overseas missions are good, like we send money over to Haiti or if uh, Joe and Mark go around the, uh, the islands, that's good. But that happens sometimes, whereas we live here all the time and our, our ministry should start here. But when we work together, we can achieve a lot more. So evangelism by the church, corporate evangelism, is, a foundational, is foundational to individual evangelism. And you look at something like the cafe. One person can't do the cafe. But if we're working together to do the cafe, then we can reach out and show love to the people who come to the cafe. We can achieve a lot more together in reaching out. But it's not just giving the food and, and um, company and so forth. We must also explain why. Why we have hope why we love because we're forgiven people because God has brought us into a relationship with him a relationship of faith and that is why we have hope and why we have love and so we have to be prepared to explain that And as we worship this year, as we, we sit together and learn, as we do the, the life study groups, we learn how best to express to those around us the love that God has for them and the love that God has for us. So that's our, our 2020 vision. We've got, what have we got on the screen? We've got faith, faith, our relationship with God, the upward, the vertical. Hope is our relationship with self. 
love. We've got two loves. We've got love in the uh, love within the church. There we go. And we have love outside. But I'd like to add one more, and that is hope. Oh, no, it's not. It's not. <laughs> Put my glasses on. If you're thinking that you know faith, hope, and love are exercises that you have to do and they're hard work and it's all very grim. No. Philippians 1.25 Knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive so I continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. There's joy in a growing relationship with God. Romans 15.13 I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. As we grow in hope, we are brought joy. And John 15, verse 9, Jesus speaking, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things that you, so that you'll be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. As we grow in love, as we experience the love that comes from Jesus and flows out from us to those around us, we will have joy. So I guess we better put joy up on the screen as well. We might make that yellow. Okay, so the whole thing. There we go. There's my 2020 vision for this year. I, I hope it's your 2020 vision as well.